my pleasure to introduce Taylor McAdam and uh, she will talk about uh, almost uh, prime times in her spherical flows. Uh, is this good? You can see well? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today, despite the fact that uh, I was not able to attend in person. Um, right. So today I'm going to uh, be talking about the space of lattices, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, but I'll go over it again uh, briefly. Uh, so Mostly today, also, I'll be using SL2 uh, just for simplicity, uh, but everything that I mentioned, the results are formulated for SLF. Um, okay, so there are two main ways of conceptualizing the space of unimodular lattices in uh, Rn. So in the first, we identify SL, let's say, 2R in this case, up to plus minus the identity uh, with the unit tangent bundle, bundle of that for half plane via Mobius transformations. Uh, so the shaded region represents a fundamental domain for the action of SL2, uh, F, and a point in the space uh, is a point in the fundamental domain with a unit vector attached. Okay, so uh, here we, we can see that the space is non-compact because of the cusp that goes off to infinity. Uh, but because the hyperbolic volume is given by dx dy d theta over y squared, uh, the volume is indeed finite. So the other way to think about this space is as the space of unimodular lattices in Rn uh, via the identification shown. And this works because any two bases that yield the same lattice are equivalent to each other through some element of SLN Z. Um, right. So points that are high in the cusp correspond to lattices that have short vectors. Uh, note that a sequence of lattices with arbitrarily short vectors cannot converge to a lattice. Uh, in fact, by Mahler compactness criterion, a subset of the space is pre compact if and only if the lattices in that set have vectors uniformly bounded away from zero. Okay, so there's a couple of natural subgroup actions on this space. The first obvious one is the geodesic flow, uh, which can parameterize the following thing. In the upper half plane, the orbits look like circles intersecting the real line at right angles or vertical lines, and the point in the unit and in bundle is floated forward along this path. Uh, the closely related horizontal flow is parameterized uh, by the following. The orbits of this flow look like circles tangent to the real line or horizontal lines, and a point in the unit and bundle is flowed around the circle while always pointing towards the center. Um, in the upper half plane, all of these flows just diverge to infinity, but once we push it by epsilon z, you can imagine them wrapping around the fun fundamental domain I showed earlier uh, with potentially very complex behavior. Uh, so I said that the Hora Hora cycle and geodesic uh, flows are related. How are they related? Um, well, notice that if I conjugate an element u by uh, any, an element of a and take t to infinity, uh, I approach the identity. So let's generalize this in the following definition. Uh, a subgroup H of G is called more spherical if there exists G in G such that H is precisely the set of elements that are contracted to the identity under repeated conjugation by the element G. Um, it's worth noting here that H has to be the entire set of elements with this property, not just any set with this property. Um, so a more spherical subgroup is always unipotent, but the converse is not always true. So for example, the Eigenberg group is uh, horse spherical with respect to, for example, this element. Um, but the subgroup of the Heisenberg group given by this is not horse spherical um, because it is not precise the set of elements that are contracted by any particular element of A. Um, right. In general, a horse spherical subgroup of SLNR is one that is conjugate to a, a block upper triangle of unipotent. Okay. Um, 
echo distribution, what it means varies slightly depending on the context, but informally, a subset of some space is echo distributed with respect to a measure if it spends the expected amount of time in subsets, measurable subsets. This corresponds to the weak convergence of a family of measures subverted on some averaging sequence converged into the measure of interest. So, for example, a sequence in X echo distributes with respect to a measure mu if sampling to time n along this sequence converges to the average with respect to mu as n goes to infinity for all functions, some space of test functions. For the purposes of this talk, we're going to use compactly supported spin functions. If we wanted to consider, for example, continuous flow instead of sequence, we would replace the sum with an integral up to time t and take t to infinity, and so on and so forth. We also say that echo distribution is effective if the rate of convergence is known. So, this is the thing that will probably be familiar to everyone here. In many situations, we can't hope for any reasonable measure classification. For example, orbit closures for the geodesic flow on FL2R mod SL2Z can have any Hausdorff dimension between 1 and 3, even despite the fact that it's ergodic, so almost every orbit echo distributes with respect to the hot measure. However, for porous spherical flows, we're generally in a potent flow, the story is quite different. In fact, we have a description of the orbits and invariant features summarized in the following. Let H be a porous spherical subgroup of B. For any base point F, there's a closed connected subgroup L between H and G, such that the orbit closure of H is equal to XL, and such that XL supports an L invariant probability measure with respect to which the H orbit of X echo distributes. So, if this was created for a unipotent flow, this would be Ratner's theorem. Ratner's theorem. But for porous spherical flows, this was actually known much earlier, and the techniques that can be used to prove it are more easily effectivized than Ratner's theorem. So, this is sort of the work of many people. Hedlund and Furstenberg for SL2, Berger for SL2, and Gamma co-compact with the effective monomial rate. Veach and Ellis Rizzo for a general porous spherical and Gamma co-compact. Margulis, Danny and Dan Margulis for the quantitative divergence result that's important for the non-unipotent case. Danny basically showed the above, and Strombergson and Flaminio-Forney show this for SL2 and Gamma non-uniform with an effective polynomial rate that depends on the base point. Okay, so there's a conjecture in a sort of collection of open problems collected after some conference, I believe, by Grubek, and it says that let U be a unipotent flow in a homogeneous space. If you look at just the subset of times consisting of prime times, then this should echo distribute. If the full flow echo distributes, then the flow restricted to prime times should echo distribute. So, why might we think that this is true? Well, so what's the intuition behind this? 
Although they're ergodic, you know, both of those are still sort of simple, um, more so than the GDs and flow. For example, they have zero topological entropy, um, and their orbits diverge at a polynomial rate, uh, as opposed to the exponential rate. So, um, primes are, on the other hand, quite complicated. Um, so it would be rather surprising if primes along the orbit somehow clustered in one area of the space over other areas, um, at least if the orbit itself is going everywhere equally. Um, to me, this seems like this would suggest some sort of deeper predictability of primes, which seems unlikely. Um, so like, what, what do we know about this? So there's sort of a Birkhoff uh, ergonomic theorem for primes the Borgant that implies that um, almost everywhere, almost every fit along primes is ever distributed, but uh, this conjecture is claiming something much stronger. Uh, this uh, it, it's saying explicitly which orbits are ever distributed, so this almost every statement is not sufficient. Um, and this this is related to uh, uh, this conjecture is similar in spirit to Sarnak Mobius' Franklin's conjecture, which states that the Mobius function, which is defined here, zero if n is not square of three minus one to the k if n is the product of k to two primes, um, that this should be asymptotically uncorrelated with any reasonable or deterministic sequence, which is defined as follows. Um, A sequence is deterministic if it can be realized as sort of sampling some continuous function uh, along a, a continuous dynamical system of zero topological entropy. So this kind of sequence. Um, Um, I'm, I'm not going to define topological entropy, uh, but it's a notion of complexity which essentially describes the exponential weight rate at which distinct orbits become distinguishable. Um, I'll also briefly point out that the summability properties of the Mobius function have deep implications in number theory. For example, the sum of the first n terms being little o of n is equivalent to the prime number theorem, whereas the statement that uh, big O of n to the one half plus epsilon is equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. So, so very important. Okay, so there are many partial results towards the Mobius to strainness conjecture um, for different classes of systems, um, many more than I've indicated here, but these are just a few. Um, so it's known for circle rotations and transla uh, translations of the compact group. And this is effective uh, by Ingradoff and Davenport. Um, Bing Tao showed it for nil flows. This is also effective. Um, Morgan, Sarnik, Ziegler, uh, and Peckner show this for quote flows on homogeneous spaces, but they wrapped it zero. So it's not. In fact, uh, Green and Tau are able to see their architectural debug to apply that corollary, the epic distribution of prime times and nil floats. Um, one might then wonder if it's possible to use the Mobius to screen result of for Gansorn and Googler and Pregnant um, in order to resolve the conjecture of Margulis, but unfortunately their results cannot be easily made effective as these Ratner theorems. Um, so it's not entirely clear how this would be done. Um, nevertheless, there is some progress on this conjecture. Uh, so recall that a number is called almost prime if it has fewer than a fixed number of prime factors. Um, in particular, primes are almost prime of all order. The following theorem of Sarnak and Ugas states that there's some fixed number L such that any dense core cycle orbit in SL bar mod FL Z to almost prime times order L is also dense. Um, in fact, they, they show that primes are dense 
in a set of positive measure with the remark that their methods yield this result as well. So the goal of my research is to generalize this result of Zarnak and Ubis to higher dimensions, which I did in the following way. So let U of T be a course flow on SLMR and gamma lattice. Consider the subset of orbit of X consisting of almost prime times A of L of X. If gamma is compact, the dynamics are minimal because every orbit is dense, and there's uniform L such that almost prime of the order are dense for every base point X. And if gamma is not compact, you should be a little bit more careful because there will be orbits with intermediate behaviors as described in the classification theorem stated earlier. So this makes a uniform statement more difficult, and so we introduce this star base point condition, which depends on a parameter delta. And I'll explain more what this means a bit later, so for now you can just think of this as in some way measuring how close the base point is to a point with a proper orbit closure. So I'm just going to box that all off and sort of talk about that a little bit later. So some notes about this theorem. So currently this theorem can be stated due to arbitrary horospherical for gamma co-compact and for euphelion for gamma SLNZ. But work calls for the removal of the abelian assumption, and I'm currently working with Manuel, who's in the audience, to get rid of base point dependence using a method that's similar to what Sarnik and Ufis do in their original paper. Also, the constant L depends autonomically on N and D, and in the non-compact case, inversely on delta. So there's three main steps to the proof. The first is to prove effective eigen distribution for the continuous spherical, and this was basically known, but sort of fills in a gap in the literature. The second step is this continuous spherical to prove effective eigen distribution for arithmetic sequences of times using a method of Venkatesh. And the third uses the effective eigen distribution of arithmetic sequences along with an upper and lower bound received to get the statement about all these times. Can you both go back one second to the previous slide and say something about the second condition? About the this? Yes. Condition? Yes. Yeah, so I will talk about that a little bit later when I'm talking about the proof. But as I said, so essentially a way of measuring how close the base point is to a point with a proper orbit closure. Yeah, so I will talk about this in a couple of slides. Great. Okay. So once we have the statement about arithmetic progressions, the theorem follows. Is there a question? No. No, sorry. Can't hear. Once we have the statement about arithmetic progressions, the theorem follows quite easily. And since I'm not a number theorist, this is just a bulk box to me. So I'll focus the discussion mostly on steps one and two. I'll also remark starting with the seed methods along with the distribution of arithmetic sequences to direct their result. Their method for obtaining the distribution result is different. They prove the distribution of arithmetic progressions directly without first going through the continuum as well. And they more represent a theoretic technique. 
Um, my methods are softer and more dynamical, uh, but they produce a worse grade. So um, before getting into the effective of distribution of the continuous flow, I wanted to state for comparison a uh, qualitative of distribution for the continuous flow. Um, so this is essentially a thing I think. Um, and so for every, uh, for every point in our space, either we have echo distribution, that's condition 1A, or uh, there's some Some rational subspace uh, such that some white rational subspace W such that WG is U invariant, that's one B. So in one in one A, all the points generic, and Berkhoff theorem says that most every point is generic. Um, and case one B, if we think of X as a lattice, then the space is a modular lattice. Says that there's some sense of space spanned by vectors in X that is fixed by U. Um, so if this is the case, then the orbit of X obviously can't be distributed because it remains always inside a lower dimensional subspace. So basically, every orbit of X distributes unless there's some explicit algebraic uh, structure. Um, so this is this is pretty amazing in dynamics, right? Like it's much stronger than for a theorem. We can actually say exactly exactly what the points are there. Okay, so making this active. Uh, so let's introduce a second parameter R that describes how close to an X distributed the orbit uh, is up to time t. So here S is a syllable of norm, and this uh, norm here is any norm on, on the exterior powers of Rn. Uh, Okay. So the first possibility is that orbit up to time p is close to being echo distributed with parameter r. If this holds for all large d, all the points are generic. If a point is generic, then it'll be r generic for all large, but it's possible for a non generic point to be r generic as well. This is because closed orbits of large volume become echo distributed in x. And case 1b says that there is a rational subspace uh, W such that WG is almost fixed in the sense that there is a set of vectors uh, in X spanning WG that remain small in co-volume as measured by R when flowed by U up to time T. Um, so, yeah. So in, in, let's think about what this means in SL2, because it's simpler to think about things always in SL2. Um, this says that the vectors that are fixed by the horizontal -like flow of vertical vectors, um, so the lattices with periodic orbits are precisely the, that contain vertical vectors. And
uh, generic points, or all points will be generic in the code compiler case. Okay. Okay, so the proof idea for the theorem is proved using a method developed by Margulis in his thesis. Um, in this method, we start with an average over a short piece of, or a spherical orbit, say up to time one, and thicken it to get an average over the neighborhood of the orbit in G. Um, and then we conjugate by A to get an average over a neighborhood of a long piece of uh, horospherical horse orbit uh, up to time T. Because U is horospherical, expansion only happens in the flow direction. So we can control the size of the neighborhood and be sure that the average over this thickened region will do a good job of approximating the average along the lower dimensional orbit. Uh, this Y horospherical is so much easier to deal with and more easy to effectivize than the more general component case, uh, if we just consider it a potent flow, then we don't have this, this fact that expansion only happens in the flow direct then. Um, so then we can see points along the orbit being the result of flowing a different base point called y sub x. So this red and just replace, replace it with y sub x. Uh, and this is we can see it as being flowed by the geodesic flow up to time t. And we can use the known exponential rate of anything for the action of a on x to say that a neighborhood of the point y sub s becomes quite distributed. However, this requires that the neighborhood injects into x. Although this can't be guaranteed for all points of the orbit, the quantitative non-divergence results of Danny and Mark Willis imply that for a large proportion of the s from 0 to 1, um, the neighborhood of y sub s will inject, and that basically completes the proof. So to give a little bit more detail on that, we have this exponential rate of mixing for the geodesic flow. Um, and via a change of variables, we can see the, our average along the orbit of u up to time t as uh, sort of this thing that looks almost like uh, the, the integral above. We have a couple of problems that we need to deal with to make the, the exponential mixing theorem directly apply. We have that this function here is not smooth, but that's very easy to deal with. Um, we just involve with a smooth approximation to the identity. Uh, the integral here is over u, not over x, but that's where the thickening comes in. We thicken and get an integral in d and project to x. We need to make sure it injects. Um, and then this base point, which I called y sub s before, is, is moving. It depends on x. Uh, but that's where we use the quantitative non-divergence results of Danny and Margulis, and that implies that we can get a good rate of convergence for all but a small proportion of the points in the unit ball. Okay. So now we're moving on to step two in the proof outline I gave earlier. Um, I don't want to worry you too much with exactly what this says. The important thing to note is that on the left-hand side, we have the ergodic average over arithmetic sequences of step size k up to time p. And on the right-hand side, we're able to bound this. Um, we're able to bound this away from the space average in terms of k and the equidistribution rate from the previous theorem, as well as some double up norm of f. And um, I'll point out that for technical reasons in the proof, here we require that you be abelian. Um, in the case of gamma co-compact, the result for almost primes follows from the abelian case. Um, but for gamma, the SLN Z, it doesn't. Um, however, the uh, abelian assumption can still be removed in that case using a different method. Okay. So the proof idea here is um, a method uh, that Ben Tesh uses in this sparse equidistribution uh, paper. 
Okay. Uh, he does this for the work like flow on compact quotients of SL2R, and for simplicity of exposition, I'm going to restrict to the case that he considers. Okay, so let E sub KT at be the normalized average over the sequence of step size K up to time T. We want to show that this is small as T goes to infinity. Um, so we're just going to consider uh, functions average zero. Um, okay. <coughs> so we're going to start by introducing a new function, f sub h, which is the average of f over the first few iterates where we're thinking of h as being small with respect to t, and in the end, it's going to turn out to be a small power of t. Uh, notice that the average uh, of f sub h is close to the average of f. It's in the case of s, f sub h, we're taking, the average of, we're taking an average of averages, and all of the terms will cancel out, except for those at the boundaries. Um, since we consider h to be small with respect to t, this error is going to turn out to be negligible. Does this picture make sense? Yes. Yes? Okay. Okay. So now instead of taking the average sub t, K over iterates of size k, let's average over small delta neighborhoods of these points. Um, the neighborhoods are in U. Um, call this average E sub t k delta, um, and it's now going to be represented by an integral. These two methods of averaging will be close depending on f and delta, since our functions are assumed to be uniformly continuous. So now our goal is to show that. Um, E sub T K delta is small. Okay, so to show this average is small, consider it square. If we expand this out and massage it a little bit uh, by, for example, applying Vincent's inequality and using positivity of the integrand to expand the domain and applying the <coughs> and the middle sum, we get the following inequality. You don't have to <laughs> try and do that in your head, but just trust me. Um, okay. Now, if we apply our effect x distribution theorem for the continuous flow to the inside integral, uh, get the following. And then, we utilize known bounds of the decay of matrix coefficients for the action of SL2R on L2FX to get the following bound here. So our goal is to make this small, remember. So I've just carried this over to the next page. Um, if we look at this last quantity, uh, so we know we can split the double sum into two regions, a region near the diagonal and a region away from the diagonal. Um, in the region uh, away from the diagonal, we have a uniformly good rate of convergence. And uh, near the diagonal, we have cold convergence, um, but the overall contribution to the double thumb is small because just most of the double sum occurs away from the diagonal. Um, and this is where the extra averaging was vital. If we look at the last slide, uh, you see that this quantity is controlling how quickly different transits of F become uncorrelated. Um, in general, different transits of F don't necessarily become uncorrelated. Uh, quickly, that is. Um, I mean, on the diagonal, they don't become uncorrelated at all, but they do become uncorrelated quickly on average. And that's what the use of the extra averaging was for. So by balancing the various error terms that are posed in different parts of the proof, we arrive 
at the formulas for H and delta that give us the rate that we want. As I mentioned earlier, the seeding follows quite readily. It's basically just a machine. So that's where I'll stop my talk. Thank you. For now. So let's thank the speaker. Questions? In Bogan's paper, he also proves the sparse ergodic theorems for polynomial times. Is that yes. easier in this case? Can you say something yes. about, about can you say something yes. about polynomial times? Um, probably I haven't, but that's um, actually what Venkatesh in his paper does. He does it for small powers of n, like one plus gamma, where gamma is very small, and the one plus gamma, where gamma is small. And it is conjectured that polynomial sequences should also be equidistributed. But n square is for the moment not accessible. Not accessible, no. Okay. Um, but probably small powers can be done in the SLN case as well. Other questions? Well, then we thank you one more time.